हे गाइस वेलकम टू डेटा ट्रैक योर वन स्टॉप चैनल फॉर ऑल द डेटा साइंस एंड मशीन लर्निंग अपडेट्स इन टूडेज वीडियो वी विल लुक एट सम ऑफ द मस्ट नो मैथमेटिक्स फॉर मशीन लर्निंग विल कवर सम ऑफ द बेसिक्स एंड फंडामेंटल्स ऑफ मैथमेटिक्स विच आर यूज द लॉट इन मशीन लर्निंग दिस विल ऑल्सो हेल्प यू लेटर वैन यू रीड सम ब्लॉग्स एंड पेपर्स बिकॉज द फंडामेंटल्स एंड बेसिक्स आर ऑलरेडी क्लियर यू आर क्लियर विद द नोटिस एंड सो ऑन एंड ऑल्सो इट मे हेल्प यू इन मशीन लर्निंग इंटरव्यूज वैन देर कैन बी सम क्वेश्चन अराउंड मैथमेटिक्स सो विद दैट लेट्स गेट स्टार्टेड फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल वी विल स्टार्ट विद वट इज मैट्रिक्स ए मैट्रिक्स इज ए मैथमेटिकल स्ट्रक्चर दैट कंसिस्ट ऑफ एन ऑर्डर्ड सेट ऑफ नंबर्स अरेंज इन रोज एंड कॉलम्स If there is just one row in your matrix, it's called a row matrix. Column matrix has just one column. Square matrix has same number of rows and columns. And if all elements outside the main diagonal are zero and only the diagonal are non-zero, then it's called a diagonal matrix. Next, we will look at rank of a matrix. The rank of a matrix gives the maximum number of linearly independent row vectors or column vectors in the matrix. It's only defined for square matrices. Thus, the rank of a matrix is a measure of the dimension of the space spanned by its rows or columns. If we take the first example where A is a two cross two matrix, the second row is just uh, two times the first row. So there is just one linearly independent row. Thus, the rank of matrix is one. in the second case the third column can be derived from the first two column that is 2 into first column plus 3 into second column will give you the third column thus there are just two independent columns and therefore the rank of matrix is 2 while in the third case none of the rows or columns can be all transformed to zero which basically means none of the rows or columns can be derived from another rows or columns therefore the rank of matrix c is 3 and it's a 3 cross 3 matrix as well thus it's a full rank matrix and this concept is very important we'll see later that when when a matrix is full rank in that case the determinant exist so uh, next we will look at determinant of a matrix so determinant of a matrix what is it it provides information about the matrix that include whether the matrix is invertible one thing and second thing the scaling factor by which the matrix stretches or shrinks the space it operates on so uh, this is the geometrical meaning of determinant that what it means that when a matrix uh, has non zero determinant that it is invertible and secondly uh, the value of determinant denotes the scaling factor by which the matrix stretches or shrinks the space it operates on so we will look into it in more de details we'll understand it in the next slide but for this slide let's understand how a determinant is calculated and uh, what is the significance of determinant we'll keep it to the next slide so determinant uh, of a matrix is calculated uh, using a into d minus b into c so a d minus b c for a 2 cross 2 matrix and similarly the formula can be extended for 3 4 and higher dimension matrices uh, so determinant of a matrix for a, when it's two dimensional is given by ad minus bc so for a matrix this which is 2 cross 2 the determinant is 1 into 4 minus 2 into 3 which is minus 2 and for this case 5 into 3 15 minus 7 into 2 14 which is equal to 1 so we have seen how determinant of a matrix is calculated let's understand the significance of determinant in the last slide we look at how determinant is calculated in this slide let's look at the graphical and geometrical interpretation of determinant of a matrix the determinant of a matrix has significant graphical or geometric interpretation the first being scaling factor which basically means the absolute value of determinant of a matrix represent the scale factor by which the area in 2d or volume in 3d is scaled when a geometrical shape undergoes the linear transformation defined by a so a is the matrix and we define a square Uh, unit square in coordinate in coordinate space of x y uh, axis so the points will be 0 0 0 1 1 0 1 1 1 now when we transform each point 0 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 and 1 1 through the matrix the point 1 0 becomes 2 0 similarly 0 0 remains 0 0 1 0 becomes 2 0 0 1 becomes 0 2 and 1 1 becomes 2 2 right when we do the matrix multiplication now the original square was a unit square and now if we calculate the area of this transformed uh, uh, geometrical shape uh, when we multiply it with the matrix a uh, the 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 area of that transformed 
uh, vectors is 4 which is equal to the de determinant of a so that is what we are saying here the uh, the determinant represent the scale factor by which the uh, geometric shape undergoes linear transformation second thing also it denotes the orientation uh, whether the linear transformation preserves the orientation of the basis vectors or not so if determinant is greater than zero it means that transformation will preserve the orientation and if the determinant of the matrix is less than zero the transformation reverses the orientation that is it becomes the mirror refraction like in case if the matrix was not 2002 but minus 2002 the points uh, 1 0 would have become minus 2 0 and the area would have still be minus 4 but it would have not preserved the orientation that is it would have not remained in the first quadrant but changed the quadrant right so if determinant uh, is negative it means that uh, the orientation is not preserved and determinant the value of determinant basically means when a geometrical shape undergoes linear transformation through this matrix then the determinant of this matrix mean uh, will denote the scale factor by which the geometric shape will get scaled up and last thing is invertibility so whenever the determinant is zero the matrix is non-invertible and if the determinant is non-zero it means the inverse of the matrix exists that is it is invertible and what is inverse when a matrix is multiplied by its inverse we get the identity matrix that is uh, the identity matrix is one which has one in its diagonal and all the other elements are zero so if determinant is zero in matrix is non-invertible and if determinant is non-zero that means the matrix is invertible a non-zero determinant implies that the matrix is invertible and thus the linear transformation is reversible so the we have seen how determinant is calculated and secondly what is scaling factor it is the the when the matrix a uh, transform a geometrical shape the determinant will denote the scale factor by which this geometric shape will get scaled up and the sign of determinant will denote whether the um, uh, orientation will be preserved or it can get uh, it the orientation can change or reverse and invertibility basically means if determinant is non-zero the matrix is invertible its inverse exists and if determinant is zero the inverse doesn't exist so we have already seen this thing but let's revisit it uh, that what happens when a vector gets multiplied by a matrix in last case also we were multiplying a vector with a matrix but what uh, let's see it in more details that what happens when a vector gets multiplied by a matrix when a vector is multiplied by a matrix it undergoes a linear transformation such as it can get scaled or it can even get rotated consequently the matrix is called transformation matrix so whenever you multiply a vector with a matrix the matrix is transformation matrix and the vector can get scaled or it can get rotated and so on the concept uh, this concept of uh, the vector transformation through the transformation matrix is very helpful in various fields including computer graphics physics and machine learning uh, given a vector v the, and a transformation matrix a the, the generic form of transformation to scale the vector by a along x axis and b along y axis is as following so so we are saying if the vector is x and y and we want to just scale it by a times in x axis and b times in y axis then this is the transformation matrix we should only have the uh, diagonal elements as uh, non-zero and uh, all other elements are zero so a into x ax and uh, 0 into x plus b into y it is b y so if you just want to scale the uh, vector by a times in x axis and b times in y axis then this should be the transformation matrix and also transformation matrix exists when you want to rotate the vector so that's an interesting case let's look at that uh, so transform matrix or vector rotation suppose your vector was this x and y which was making a uh, angle of v with respect to the x-axis now you want to rotate it by uh, theta degree now uh, we can this is the transformation matrix which is cos theta minus sin theta sin theta and cos theta which will represent the uh, uh, transform vector which is x dash y dash and here the vector got rotated by theta angle so this is the transformation matrix 
and um, just to prove to you that this is the transformation matrix and how it's uh, derived i am going in details otherwise uh, just the concept that i want to tell you is that uh, the matrix is transformation matrix which can either scale it like we saw in the last case or it can uh, rotate it as well so quickly let's go through the derivation to uh, prove to you that the this matrix will rotate the vector by theta degree so we can represent x and y in the polar form as x is equal to r cos v and y is equal to r sin v similarly x dash uh, the trans after transformation we want x to be x dash and y to be y dash and x dash is equal to r cos v plus theta and y equal to r sin v plus theta and we can expand the cos x plus y formula and sin x plus y formula we get x dash is equal to r cos v cos theta minus r sin v sin theta and we already know from here x is equal to r cos v and v is equal, y is equal to r sin v replacing that we get x dash equal to x cos theta minus y sin theta similarly y dash is equal to y cos theta plus x sin theta now we know we want to transform x to x dash and that is possible if we are able to do uh, do some multiplication and get this and for y if we can do some multiplication and get this so if we can get that by multiplying by this matrix so x will become uh, cos x minus sin theta v so x cos theta minus sin theta v that is what we wanted and similarly y will become sin theta x plus y cos theta y uh, y will become x sin theta plus y cos theta exactly so that is how uh, this is the transformation matrix to rotate the vector by uh, theta degree similarly the transformation also exists in higher dimension if the vector is of three dimension four dimension and so on now let's look at solving system of equation in this slide we will understand singularity non singularity rank determinant inverse of a matrix all in one place suppose we have a series of equation to solve that is 2x plus y equal to 3 0x plus y equal to 1 we can represent the coefficients of x and y as matrix a x is equal to x and y and b is equal to the final value that we want to solve it for and when we solve it we get that y is equal to 1 because 0 x is 0 so y is equal to 1 and we if we uh, replace y is equal to 1 x is equal to 3 minus 1 by 2 which is equal to 1 uh, so the answer is x equal to 1 y equal to 1 right so here in this case if we look at the matrix a the rank of matrix is the maximum number of linearly independent rows and in this case it's 2 hence a is a non singular matrix because it has non zero determinant the inverse exist and it's a full rank matrix and also it has a unique solution so when a is non singular it means it has non zero determinant the inverse exist it is full rank that is the rank is 2 which is the actual size of the matrix 2 cross 2 and uh, it has unique solution right in the second case if we see uh, 2x plus y equal to 3 4x plus 2y equal to 6 if we write matrix ab we can see that the second row is just one two times the first row second row is just two times the first row hence a is singular in this case a was non singular because it was a full rank matrix determinant exist inverse exist and had a unique solution but in this case it's a singular matrix that is determinant is zero it doesn't inverse doesn't exist it's not a full rank matrix and it has multiple solutions you can see that when we solve for it we get 2x plus y equal to 3 and there can be multiple x and y for example x equal to 0 y equal to 3 x equal to 1 y equal to 1 all of these solutions are possible uh, uh, hence there are multiple solutions in the third case 2x plus y equal to 3 4x plus 2y equal to 7 uh, when we simplify we get 2x plus y equal to 3 2x plus y equal to 3.5 it's not possible right it's an anomaly because it's contradicting and when we look at the matrix a second row can be obtained from the uh, first row into two right second equation contradicts the first equation and second row is two times first row hence again a is singular matrix that is determinant is zero inverse doesn't exist it's not a full rank matrix and as well as it has no solution so when a is no so non singular the determinant is non zero inverse exist it's a full rank matrix and a unique solution and when a is singular determinant is zero inverse doesn't exist it's not a full rank matrix and it can either have multiple solutions or it can have no solution so that is very important concept 
Next, we will look at how is machine learning problem represented in form of matrices. Let's say the problem statement is to predict house prices based on three features, area square, number of bedrooms and distance to the city center. The linear e regression equation in the matrix form would look like this, where Y represents the house prices for each property and X is the uh, matrix representing the feature matrix that is what is the actual square foot area, how many bedrooms it has, what is the distance from city center and for what is for the second house, third house and so on. So X is a matrix representing the feature matrix, each row represents, represents one of the properties of these features or value of these features and error uh, vector is the error term representing the difference between predicted and actual house prices. So basically the ML model will try to explain whatever it is not able to explain will be here. And coefficients beta are the thing that we are trying to estimate that uh, how much is the dependence of price on uh, bedroom, distance and square foot area. So these are the coefficients we learn to aim in the training pro uh, process and they represent the contribution of each feature to the prediction of house prices. And the goal is to find best fitting values of beta to minimize the prediction error so that the errors are minimum and we are able to understand that how much the bedroom contributes to price, how the, much the distance contributes to price, how much the area of the property contributes to price and so on. So these betas will be learned and everything can be represented in forms of uh, matrix and vectors and even vector is nothing but a single column matrix. And why are matrix operations computationally efficient? Matrix operations can be parallelized, meaning that multiple calculations can be performed simultaneously. Think of in terms of matrix addition multiplication, right? When you are adding, you are adding this element with this, this with this, this with this, this with this. So all of them can happen in parallel. And many hardware architectures such as GPUs and CPUs are designed to handle matrix operations efficiently. You can also think of the multiplication where you multiply A11 with B11, A12 with B21, A21 with B12, A22 with B22. So when you are doing this multiplications, many of them can be parallelly computed, right? So modern processor supports vectorized instructions that allow operations to be performed on multiple data sets simultaneously. Matrix operations, especially those involving large matrices benefit, benefit from this vectorized instructions leading to significant speed ups. And these CPUs, GPUs are designed to handle matrix operations efficiently. Next, we will look at the inverse of a matrix and its application in machine learning. We already touched upon it that inverse means where for a matrix, there exists another matrix. When we multiply them, we get the identity matrix. So basically A into A inverse is equal to A inverse into A is equal to identity matrix where all the diagonal elements are one and everything is non-zero. So for this matrix 2, 5, 1, 3, this is the inverse matrix. We can see that when we multiply these uh, two matrices, we get the identity matrix. Hence for A, 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 this matrix is the inverse matrix and for this matrix, this is the inverse matrix. And how is it uh, helpful in machine learning? Uh, the applications of matrix inverse in machine learnings are huge. Uh, the closed form solution of linear regression is X transpose X whole inverse X transpose Y where X is the uh, feature vector. So you can see that we need to calculate the inverse of X transpose X, right? Similarly, the closed form solution of ridge regression is X transpose X plus lambda I whole inverse X transpose Y. So where Y is the actual uh, training label and X is the feature vector, we can clearly see that here also we need the inverse of the matrix and also uh, for solving linear equations, matrix inversion is used for advanced optimization algorithms like Newton methods, uh, matrix inversion is required to invert the Hessian matrix. So we will look that also in this video, what is Newton method and there also we need the inversion of the uh, Hessian matrix. And uh, good to know fact that for linear and rich, the closed form solution exists, but it doesn't exist for lasso because the function is non-differentiable at zero. Hence, we use iterative optimization algorithms. We'll look at those as well in this video. So next, we'll look at eigenvectors and eigenvalues. So for every matrix A, there exists a family of special vectors called eigenvectors. And these are non-zero vectors when multiplied by that matrix A, they only get scaled, stretched or compressed along the same direction. They don't get rotated and all, they just get scaled or compressed in the same direction. 
each eigen vectors has a corresponding eigen value associated with it which represent the factor by which eigen vector is scaled during this transformation so in other words for a matrix a there exist eigen vector v which just get scaled by lambda uh, when multiplied with matrix a so a v equal to lambda v a v can also be written as lambda i into v and v if and v if we bring this term here it becomes a minus lambda i v equal to 0 now a minus lambda i v equal to 0 we have already said that eigen vectors is a family of non zero vectors so v can't be zero so only possibility is a minus lambda i is a singular matrix then only it can be zero right so determinant is zero so if we calculate the determinant let's say a for some uh, uh, matrix a equal to 5 4 1 2 if we calculate this a minus lambda i and determinant is equal to 0 then we can find the value of lambda lambda equal to 6 and lambda equal to 1 and when we put this back in the matrix 5 minus let's say start with 6 5 minus 6 4 1 and 2 minus 6 we can solve and we can get uh, the family of vectors for example here we are getting x is equal to 4 y so uh, vectors 4 and 1 will satisfy similarly we can solve for the other lambda which is uh, 1 and we will get the vector minus 1 and 1. So, these are the vectors which when multiplied by this matrix will just get scaled in the same direction. They won't change orientation, they won't get rotated and so on and the factor by which they will get scaled is this lambda which is 6 and 1 for this vector 1 for this vector 6. So, this is what eigenvalues and eigenvectors are. For a matrix there exists a special set of vectors which just get scaled or compressed in the same direction they don't change directions are the eigenvectors and the amount of scaling or compression that happens is given by the eigenvalue and where is eigenvectors and values used in machine learning before looking into that we also need to understand what is projection vector once we know eigenvectors and eigenvalues and projection vector we can look at where it is exactly used in machine learning so next next let's look at what is projection vector the vector projection of one vector over another vector is just the length of shadow of the given vector over another vector. So, if this is a vector, the shadow it has on the uh, other vector, let's say OB vector, OA vector has a shadow of OL on OB vector, right? So, this OL, uh, the magnitude of it will become the projection of it. So, it is obtained by multiplying the magnitude of uh, given vector along with the co cosine of the angle between the two vectors the resultant vector projection form is is a scalar value so for vector oa when it is projected in vector ob the shadow is ol and ol is the vector projection so ol can also be written as oa into cos theta right and we already know that dot product of a and b vector is a b cos theta and we just want a cos theta so b so, projection vector of A on B can be written as A dot B by B because B and B will get uh, cancelled out and A cos theta will remain. Similarly, the projection vector of B on A is A dot B and here the denominator will be the A's because the projection vector will be uh, the projection vector will be B cos theta, right? So, so the projection vector uh, of vector o A on B is A B, A dot B by B and projection vector of b on a is a dot b divided by a right so we'll see an example let's say uh, calculate the projection of vector this onto vector uh, this right so we'll first calculate the dot product is dot product is 17 and we have to calculate the projection of vector a on b so we divide by uh, b b uh, magnitude right so here we'll divide by the magnitude of this vector which is uh, 5 square plus minus 3 whole square plus 3 square which becomes 43 so 17 by 43 but if we wanted to calculate the projection of uh, this vector on this we would take uh, take the dot product but divide by the magnitude of this vector then we would have got the projection of second vector on the first right so uh, that's it projection of the vector that is the shadow one vector leaves on the another is called projection vector now together uh, why are eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a matrix important and where they are used in machine learning? So, uh, they are used in principal component analysis. What is PCA in statistics and machine learning? PCA involves finding the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of correlation matrix. So, PCA is a dimensionality reduction techniques. Let's say you have lot of features. You have n number of features and you want to reduce the features to d. Uh, while keeping the goodness of all uh, the features. So, what you can do is you can calculate the eigenvectors of the correlation matrix or the covariance matrix 
and uh, the eigen vectors represent the principal component and eigen values represent the variance along each component so basically we will for n dimension features we will have n eigen vectors and uh, the variance along each eigen vector will be denoted by its eigen value now uh, for n features we have n eigen vectors and all the eigen vectors may not be important right we can look at the value of uh, eigen value and see that which are the top uh, important eigen vectors and we can project all the data points on these eigen vectors so if i just take k eigen vectors and do a projection of all the data points on first eigen vector then second then third and lastly at k we will get only k dimensions so n dimensions will get reduced to k so pca is widely used for dimensional reduction and data compression by projecting data points onto the eigen vectors associated with the highest variance determined by the corresponding eigen value so uh, the idea of projection of a vector and uh, eigen vectors are used in pca and it's also used the concept of eigen vectors and eigen values in raising a matrix to the power of n where n can be very high suppose you want uh, a raised to the power of x what you can do is you can keep on multiplying a with itself and then a third time fourth time fifth time you have to keep continuously multiplying the matrix to get to raise a matrix to the power of x but other way you can also do is you we know that for matrix a there will exist a set of eigenvectors right v1 v2 up to vn so there exist a set of eigenvectors which just get scaled so the amount they get scaled can be given by their eigen values which is uh, the diagonal elements are non zero and all others are zero so we have a vect set of vectors p when the eigen values so we can write ap is equal to p lambda now we can use the inverse formula uh, so a is equal to p lambda and this will go right side p inverse so we know a can be represented as p lambda p inverse now i have to multiply a x times right so which simply means p lambda p inverse if i have to multiply a two times it will means p lambda p inverse p lambda p inverse so p inverse and p will get cancelled out and lambda will get square and i will get p lambda square p inverse right so that is what they are saying that if we have to multiply a x times then all the p and p inverse continuously they will keep cancelling out because we know p and p inverse is equal to i identity matrix and finally we just get p lambda to the power of x and p inverse and doing lambda to the power x is very simple because all the non diagonal elements are zero so we can just raise lambda to the power of x which is a simple thing to do multiply it with p and p inverse and we will get a raised to the power x without actually multiplying a x number of times just uh, taking the p matrix p inverse and just raising the lambda matrix which is the vector of, uh, which is a matrix of eigen values by x times we can get the a to the power of x so it's used in diagonalization of matrices to raise the matrix to a power and uh, this eigen vectors and eigen values concept can be used and it simplifies the process so till now we looked at a uh, lot of concepts of matrix uh, basically uh, what is a matrix rank of a matrix determinant of a matrix what is the significance or meaning of determinant of a matrix and how it's calculated what happens when a vector gets multiplied by a matrix it can either get scaled or transformed rotated uh, we also looked at how when does the solution exist for a set of equation when we are solving them singularity non singularity rank determinant inverse of a matrix how why matrix are important and how uh, in machine learning we can represent the problem formulation in form of matrices why matrix operations are computationally efficient and there are these cpus and gpus designed for this type of calculations we'll also looked at inverse of a matrix and where the inverse uh, of a matrix is used in machine learning we looked at eigen values eigen vectors projection vector and how they are used in the concept of principal component analysis and diagonal diagonalization of matrix that is raising ma easily matrix to the power to the power of x now we'll take a slight detour from matrices and talk about other mathematical concepts uh, like derivative gradient and so on so what is the derivative or gradient of a function the derivative of a function at a point represents the rate at which the function is changing at that point it gives the slope of the tangent line to the graph of the function at a specific point so it's 
change in y to that the that of change of x in it's also called as rise or fall over run so change in x is called run and change in y is called rise or fall and what is a gradient gradient is a vector that generalizes the concept of derivative for a function of multiple variables the gradient is a vector of partial derivatives where partial derivative means each component represents the rate of change of a function with respect to one of the variables assuming others are constant we'll look at it so uh, we'll start with something simple that the derivative is negative when uh, the function is decreasing when the function remains constant the derivative is zero and when the function is increasing the derivative is positive that is the uh, sign of the gradient so let's use derivative and gradient synonymously but uh, to differentiate derivative is the slope or rate of change of a function at a point and gradient generalizes the concept of derivative in case of multiple dimensional uh, vec uh, vector or multiple dimensional variables um, the gradient vector will represent the derivative partial derivative with of the function with respect to one variable at a time keeping others constant some example to understand gradient bit better here the change in y and change in x is proportional so the gradient is 3 by 3 equal to 1 here the change in y is negative and it's more uh, stronger than the change in x so gradient is minus 2 minus 4 by minus 2 here the change in y is positive and more uh, uh, than the change in x so 4 by 2 equal to 2 gradient is 2 and in this case the function remains constant so the gradient is uh, 0 by change in x is 5 so 0 by 5 is 0 the gradient is denoted by symbol del of f or also del f by del x or f dash of x f dash of x denotes lagrange notation and del f by del x denotes leibniz notation so basically the same concept they have different notations this is called lagrange's notification and this is called leibniz uh, notation next we'll look at what are minima maxima and saddle points and what is gradient at these points so we all we have already seen for a function when it's decreasing gradient is negative so gradient is negative and uh, when the function is increasing here in the second half the gradient is positive and at the minima which is the lowest point gradient becomes zero so in the first figure when graph is decreasing the function its derivative is negative at the minima the gradient becomes zero and directly to the right of the function as the function begins to increase the derivative become positive similarly for this function which is concave function this is a convex function for a concave function when it's increasing the derivative or gradient is positive at the maxima the gradient is zero and when the function is decreasing the gradient becomes uh, negative and uh, a critical point of a function is a uh, is a point where the derivative is either zero or undefined and there all there can also exist cases in which the derivative to the either side of the critical point uh, does not change sign for example here uh, we know that at minima and maxima the gradient is zero and also the gradient changes sign right but there can be cases where this is a increasing function the gradient is positive here the positive here but momentarily it becomes uh, zero when it's at this point similarly uh, for this function which is decreasing the gradient is negative and negative but momentarily when it's little flat the gradient becomes zero so these kind of points are called saddle point which are not the extremum these are not minima or maxima just that the gradient momentarily becomes zero uh, but they are not minima or maxima but in this case where the gradient becomes zero and also the gradient changes sign there it can be a minima or maxima so this is important to know minima maxima saddle point saddle point is where uh, which is neither a maxima neither a minima but uh, momentarily the gradient becomes zero and doesn't change sign so minima maxima saddle point and gradient at minima and maxima are zero and also for saddle points is zero which is neither a minima nor a maxima now strategically how to find minima or maxima first derivative test is one of the tests which can help us to find whether the when gradient is becoming zero we can simply tell that whether it's a minima point or maxima point because we have seen for both minima and minima maxima gradient is zero so we should be able to tell that okay this is a uh, this is a uh, minima point this is a maxima point right so we can use first derivative test the first derivative test says that when the gradient is zero and just to the left of it the gradient is positive and just to the right of it gradient is 
negative then means it's a local maxima similarly when the gradient is zero and just to the left of it the gradient is negative and just to the right of it the gradient is positive then it's a local minima so in the first graph f as f dash x change sign from positive to negative uh, at every point cl uh, uh, close to c at c the uh, gradient is zero and every point on the left is uh, positive and every point on the right is negative so it's a local maxima and similarly here at c it's zero and every point on the left it's negative and every point on the right it's positive then it's a uh, minima so this is the first derivative test uh, there also exists a second derivative test. To understand second derivative test, let's first understand this function. So let's say uh, this blue one is the function and as the uh, function is increasing, we can see that we know that the gradient is positive, right? And at this point where it's a local maxima, the gradient will become zero. So it's positive and here it becomes zero. Similarly, the function is decreasing and this is the minima, right? So gradient will be negative and become zero at the minima and then the function is increasing so gradient will be positive so f dash the red line representing the uh, gradient of uh, function f or derivative of function f now if we just take the red line and try to find its derivative we know that the function is uh, decreasing and here it reaches the minima so derivative is negative and here it becomes zero Similarly, the function is now increasing, so uh, the gradient become positive. So for the function uh, which is the blue line, we see that the red line is the first derivative and again if we take one more times the derivative of uh, the red line, we get the black line. So black line represents the second derivative of function f and red line denotes the first derivative of function f. Interestingly, you will see that at the maxima. The, deriv the second derivative is negative and at the minima the second derivative is positive so that's the second derivative test that if my second derivative exists and if it's negative then it's a maxima and if my second derivative exists and it's positive then it's my local minima in calculus the first derivative of a function represents the rate at which the function is changing uh, so the first derivative is zero at extreme minima and maxima positive for increasing proportion and negative for decreasing proportion we have already seen the second derivative in turn measures the rate at which the first derivative is changing right so red line denotes the rate at which the function is changing and uh, the black line denotes the rate at which the first derivative is changing and for uh, minima points uh, the second derivative is positive and for maxima point the second derivative is negative next let's understand that why is it so important to find the minima in machine learning in machine learning the key objective is to optimize model for better performance or lowest loss to this is achieved by adjusting model parameters to minimize a cost function or loss representing the goal of reducing errors during training so we have a cost function and we want to minimize the cost function right minimize the cost and minimization will only happen when it's the uh, minima we want that function to uh, we want the parameters to be trained in such a way that we are able to reduce the loss to the minimum possible and reach that minima right so that's why finding minima is very important in machine learning that let's say this is the uh, uh, cost function we want to reach here we want to learn the parameters which can make the loss reach here so how to find this minima of a function right so finding the mi minima of a function can be done in two ways analytically or numerically analytically means we set the derivative to zero given a function f of x we have to find its derivative set the derivative equal to zero and find the points critical points and then we can use either the first derivative test or second derivative test to figure out whether it's a minima or maxima so how to solve this f dash x equal to zero we can solve the uh, algebraic equation depending on the complexity of the equation the step may involve uh, simple algebraic manipulation to solve it right that uh, find the first derivative and uh, solve for the variables where uh, first derivative is equal to zero it's very easier to solve for linear quadratic cubic differentiable and continuous functions but as the functions become tricky 
it becomes tricky and hard to solve when the functions are non-linear, multivariate, noisy, irregular, non-differentiable at certain points. It becomes very tough to solve this f dash of x equal to 0, that equation it becomes tough to solve. But uh, for linear quadratic cubic differentiable continuous function, it's easy to solve. That's why for linear regression, the closed form solution or the analytical solution exists. But as soon as we introduce non-linearity, like for example, logistic regression, when we include sigmoid, it, the closed form solution or analytical solution doesn't exist. So, uh, one way is to solve uh, for the minima analytically and the uh, point to notice it is possible when the function is linear, quadratic or simple. But as the function become non-linear, noisy, regular, non-differentiable at certain points, it becomes tricky. And once we have the uh, critical points, we can examine whether it's minima or maxima or point of inflection or saddle point using the first second derivative test to determine the nature of critical points, whether we have reached here, which is a maxima or we have reached already to our destination, which is a minima or there can be multiple minimas. Have we reached the global minima or not? We can use first or second derivative test to find that. So, uh, and how to find minima of a cost function numerically and what are some numerical methods? Numerical optimization methods are employed when the analytical methods such as setting the derivative to zero and solving for critical points algebraically is either impractical, too complex or not possible due to the nature of the function which may be non-linear, non-differentiable at certain points and so on. So when it becomes tough, we use numerical optimization methods. Otherwise, we use the analytical methods which is algebraic methods to solve it. The process of numerically finding minima involves iterative search or for the optimal values of the independent variables that minimize the function. Some of the numerical optimization methods are gradient descent, it can be newton raphson method or it can also be some greedy optimizations like genetic algorithm, fractional knapsack and so on. In this video, we will look at gradient descent and newton method in details. So, uh, what is gradient descent method to find local minima? To find local minima of a function using gradient descent, we must take steps proportional to the negative of the gradient of the function at a current point. So, if we take steps proportional to the positive of the gradient, moving towards the gradient, we will approach a local maxima of a function and the process is called gradient ascent. When we want to find the maxima, we will move in the direction positive of the gradient but if we move in the direction of negative of the gradient we will reach minima which is called gradient descent let's understand it in more details this is a function right we know that the function is decreasing here so gradient will be negative so whenever we uh, in uh, gradient descent the gradient is negative we move in that direction and if the gradient is positive the function is increasing we move in the opposite of it so always in gradient descent, we take a step proportional to the negative of the gradient. If we are here, we will move here. If we are here, we will move here. And in case we are here, then the gradient is positive. We will move in the opposite direction, not in this direction, but in the opposite. So we will basically move here only. Always move in the direction of negative of the gradient. And uh, doing that, we will reach the uh, global minima. And if there are multiple variables, then we use partial derivative. Uh, for each of the variable, we take baby steps in the direction of negative of its partial derivative. So that's the idea, always move in the direction of negative of the gradient. And if we move in a direction of positive gradient, we will we are doing gradient ascent and that can be helpful when we want to find the maxima. But for minima, move in the direction of negative of the gradient. So I have this uh, Kaggle notebook and when I uploaded this Kaggle notebook, it got a bronze medal as well. So here I have just, uh, I, will, I will add the link in the description section as well. This is a notebook and this is a simple function and for which we have written this code that uh, start at some point and do a gradient descent that is take baby steps in the direction of negative of the gradient. You can see here x is equal to x minus learning rate into gradient. So we are moving in the negative of the gradient direction and uh, uh, over multiple iterations you can see that we started with x is equal to 0 0.02 and minima was at 4 we have reached fx is equal to minus uh, 27 which is the minima and x is equal to like 3.9999 which is like 4 so we have reached the minima x equal to 4 and the value at the, that point is around minus 27 so uh, so we have uh, this function and we have also derived its uh, gradient that is derivative of function uh, this will become 3x square uh, minus 12x, right? So that is the gradient and we are taking 
steps in the direction of negative of gradient which is x is equal to x minus learning rate into gradient so this is a notebook by which you can play with it as well next we will look at newton raphson method which is a method to find root of a function and later it, we will see how this can be modified to find uh, minima of a function as well so what is newton raphson uh, method to find root of a function newton methods also known as newton raphson method is an efficient and powerful algorithm to find root of a real valued function what do we mean by root we want to find the value of the variables where the function becomes zero the final value fx is equal to zero what are the x which will make fx is equal to zero so that is what we want to learn the idea is to start with the initial guess you take any point you start with an initial guess and then to approximate the function by its tangent line and finally to compute the x intercept of this tangent line the x intercept will typically be a better approximation to the original function's root than the first guess and the method can be iterated so you start with an initial guess and then you better your guess by uh, by uh, drawing a tangent line from this point you draw a tangent line and the x intercept wherever the um, the line will touch the x axis that will be again a better guess of the root of this function right so you start with this point you draw a tangent line and the x intercept the point where this line touches the x axis is this point right which is x n plus 1 now this is a better guess than this one right now what you can do is you can again draw a tangent line from here and you will land somewhere at this point that is another best estimate of the root of the function and similarly finally you will reach the actual point where the function is touching the um, x axis which is where the func function's value is zero so that's the idea we can see that in this picture even better we started with an initial guess and from that guess we again draw a tangent line and slowly we will reach the point where the function actually touches the x axis where that is where the function actually becomes zero so that's the simple idea of uh, newton raphson method and, me and the mathematics is simple in lagrange's notation f dash of xn which is a derivative of uh, derivative of the function at this point x of n is simply the value of the function fx minus zero right because if we draw a tangent line uh, which touches the x exit at, at x axis the y is zero so here the value of y axis is value f x n and here the value of y axis is zero so f x n minus zero and here the value of x is x n and here the value of x n plus one so we started with an initial guess of x n and we want to update that guess to x n plus one so if we adjust these parameters x n plus one will go here and it will become x n plus one is equal to x n minus f of x divided by derivative at uh, the function um, at point x n right so functions value at x n divided by derivative or uh, at of the function at point x n so this is the formula and if we iterate this we will see that we will reach the point where um, value at that point of the function is zero so we'll finally reach the root of the function right so this is the simple formula and it's seen that it converges very fast like in gradient descent it might have taken thousand steps here in just four to five steps we will be able to find the root of the function that is x value where the f of x becomes zero now we know that newton's method is to find root of a function how can we modify it to find the minima the newton method can be adapted to find minima of a function by applying it to the derivative of the function because we know that at minima derivative is equal to zero right so we want to find root of the derivative of the function so simply we can adjust the uh, formula here x n plus one equal to x n minus f x by f dash of, dash of x n that is functions value at x n and derivative at x n so if you want to find not the root of f x but f dash of x this will become f dash of x and this will become f double dash double dash of x n which is second derivative of x n right so that is what's happened the method uh, uses iterative formula to refine the guess of the minima if x n is the current estimate the next estimate will be x n plus 1 it, it will be given by x n plus 1 equal to x n minus f dash of x divided by f double derivative of x n this is because uh, the minima and maxima of a function occurs when derivative is equal to zero so we are able to find root of the derivative function will end up at the minima newton method is practically appealing because it converges very fast and the assumption is that the function should be well behaved if the function is not well behaved 
uh, then and second derivative doesn't exist or the function is not continuous then it may not converge otherwise it can converge very fast and again thus i have a notebook for trying out newton raphson method as well you start with some point and here you will see that only uh, at uh, eight iterations we reach the minima so here what we have done we have derived the first derivative we have derived the second derivative right this is the first derivative and if we take again derivative of this we will get 6x minus 12 right so that is the second derivative and we simply use the formula that x is equal to x minus first derivative by second derivative x is equal to x minus first derivative by second derivative and we continuously update the x and in just eight iterations we reach the minima value uh, yeah, which is uh, 4 the minima happens at 4 so newton method is particularly appealing because of its fast convergence rate especially close to minimum uh, converged here in just eight iterations the newton method can also be extended to find minima of a function with many variables when extending newton method to a function with many variables the method employs both the gradient vector and the hessian matrix so here we will understand what the hessian matrix is so uh, we know it's just a uh, generalization of the uh, uh, is simple formula which we have already seen in in one dimension when there is just one uh, variable x this is the formula when we have multiple variables x will become a vector of x right and f the uh, derivative will become the gradient vector where we will have the partial derivative of f with respect to first variable partial derivative of f with respect to second variable and so on uh, partial derivative of f with respect to the nth variable and second derivative will be we will take derivative uh, will again take the derivative of this vector first with respect to the uh, first variable so del f by del x1 square del f by del x of del x2 right Sim and then we will again take the derivative of this with respect to second variable third variable and so on so we will get the uh, gradient vector and we will also get the hessian matrix and this so when we take the second derivative or derivative of this again uh, we call it the hessian matrix and the formula was xn equal to xn minus f dash uh, which is first derivative divided by second derivative so here it will become x equal to x minus first derivative and instead of divide by second derivative it will become as inverse right which is say in 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 matrix or vector form the uh, division becomes inverse right so we take the inverse of the hessian matrix and this becomes the uh, generalizes formula for finding uh, minima uh, of a function which has multiple variables so we uh, one thing to note is that uh, for a uh, neural network with multiple parameters multiple variables gradient descent does better because we just take the partial derivative and move in the direction of negative of um, gradient in each dimension or each variable it is a simpler process but here you will have to calculate the gradient vector you will have to calculate the hessian matrix and then inverse it and so on so newton raphson method is really good in finding minima and root of a function when the function is not that complex or it doesn't have a lot of parameters but when it has a lot of parameters the complexity also increases because finding the gradient vector hessian matrix taking inverse and so on so this method is very fast when the function or variable has uh, there are lesser number of variables and when you have more, many variables multiple parameters like a neural network the gradient descent will work uh, better so uh, with that we come to the end of this video where we covered a lot of concepts so just quickly revising all the concepts for you it will give a it will be a quick revision so we started with what is matrix what is rank of a matrix what is determinant of a matrix how is it calculated what is the significance of determinant of a matrix orientation invertibility scaling factor we looked at what happens when a vector multiplies uh, get multiplied by a matrix uh, we get this uh, matrix for um, scaling it by a along x axis and b along y axis and transformation matrix for rotation we also looked at singularity non singularity rank determinant inverse of a matrix and how this uh, is used while solving a set of equations we saw how matrices are used to represent machine learning problem why are matrix operations computationally efficient and how gpus and cpus kind of architecture are designed for them we looked at inverse of a matrix and how inverse is used in machine learning in linear regression ridge and even in hessian matrix of newton method we looked at eigenvalues eigenvectors we looked at projection vector and how these 
eigen vectors eigen value projection vector are used in uh, the uh, concept of pca and diagonalization of matrices then we looked at gradient we looked at uh, minima maxima saddle points and uh, how to find minima maxima the first derivative test second derivative test and uh, we also looked at analytical way of solving for minima and why finding minima is important in machine learning we looked at numerical methods like gradient descent we looked at newton method and newton method for multiple variables so that's it in this video hope you like the content please uh, like and subscribe and stay tuned for more such updates bye